Welcome. Welcome to this morning, this Sunday morning, this time where we are together for morning prayer. We are together despite the fact that we are physically apart. And whether or not we are listening to this all at the same time or at different times throughout our Sunday morning, know that we are joined one with another in spirit and in the love of Christ. And so I invite you at this time to settle into your morning, to quiet your mind and prepare yourself for this sacred time of togetherness and of prayer. The order for morning prayer can be found in the service leaflet that was emailed to you. can be found in your service leaflet 
on page two or in the hymnal, hymn number 657. Love divine, all loves excelling. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth God's praise, to hear God's holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. 
and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship God. Let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by God's infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him.
the Hivites and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. They will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us now go a three days' journey into the wilderness, so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I know, however, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I will perform in it. And after that, he will let you go. <clears throat> I will bring this people into such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty handed. Each woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman living in the neighbor's house for jewelry of silver and of gold clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Then Moses answered, But suppose they did not believe me or listen to me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. Moses drew back from him. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand, so that they might believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. And God said, Put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even those two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth teach you what you are to speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please rise in body or in spirit as you were able for the singing of precious Lord Take my hand.
A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this you will heap burning coals on their do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
Gracious God, we are your beloved. You formed us in your love, and it is your love that sustains us even now. We ask that you would open our hearts and our ears and our minds and our mouths to apprehend you in this moment. To receive the gift of your life moving in us even now. To trust in that gift and to go in faith where you lead. And we ask all this through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God this morning and all mornings. Amen. About, what is it now? It's nearly April, so let's say about five or six months ago, Giles and George and I got in the car and we were driving up to Delaware for Thanksgiving. And it was the kind of trip that, I think if my husband had realized exactly how far Delaware was, and how long it was going to take us to get there, we might not have actually done it. But happily, he didn't know, and so we barreled into the car with our toddler for many an hour, and spent a very happy two to three days in Delaware, in Wilmington, before getting in the car and barreling back home in time for Sunday here. And while we were up there, it was the second time that that portion of my family has spent any time with George. And one of those people is my aunt, my Auntie Cindy, who's very, very close to me. Um, and at one point, when the two of us were on our own, she said to me, wow, you are so amazing at redirecting. And I said, excuse me? And she said, the way that you just do that, like when, when George is going for something that's dangerous or that he's not supposed to be playing with, the way that you just sort of see that and you like immediately go into, George, why don't we play with this instead? Is just, is just amazing. And until that point, I didn't know that this was a technique, let alone that it had a name. And I felt rather complimented. Which, you know, if you have any parents in your life, they, they can't have too few compliments, so just keep, keep throwing those at them. It's like, it's like oxygen. But when I thought about it, I said to her, you know, I think it's because it's kind of, it's kind of fun at a certain point, because it's sort of like improvisation. Because you're sort of scanning the room and you're like, okay, the oven's not great, but what is something around here that's at least better than that. Oh, look, a spoon! Isn't this the most exciting thing you've ever seen in your life? And that's really enough to do it. It's also kind of exhausting. But when I realized that, that tendency in myself to enjoy the creativity that comes from sort of responding to the moment, I recognized more of a sort of gift that I had to bring to this parenting table than I had thought about beforehand. And suffice to say, if you told me at that point that five to six months from then, we'd be putting together a church service in this beautiful sanctuary with six people, and I'd be preaching to you with a black eye, I'd have said you were daft. But no, here we are. A black eye, I should say, sustained through improvising with my toddler son when, in attempting to put him on our bed to play, my face, sadly, was traveling in the opposite direction of the back of his head. So, improvisation, you know, can involve injury, but at the moment, I would wager whether it's us putting together this service, learning to sing and chant many psalm verses together as the hybrid congregation we are, whether it's all those dining room tables set up as work offices, 
whether it's the number of piles of books that I have around, because I know that if I lean my phone against one of them, it's at just the right angle for you to see as much of my face as you want, but very little of anything else. We seem to be in a season very much of improvising. And I wholeheartedly, on the basis of the last two weeks of my life, recognize in this time the invitation of a lifetime to a life of improvising with God. And at the same time, the very word improvise may set you off in some kind of hives, or at least get your heart racing a little bit faster. And even if you are inclined to improvise, even if you do enjoy that exercise, at least in some respects of life, even then I think for all of us as Christians, and even all of us as humans that maybe want to believe that there is something beyond ourselves but we're not really sure, and even if we do believe that there's something beyond ourselves, we're not really sure whether we can really lean into that. It's like that trust fall. We're not really sure that we can fall backwards and that God really will catch us. The two obstacles that we can have, especially in times of anxiety, and uncertainty to this invitation of an improvised life, a life of improvising with God, they come in, in two kinds, I think. One is a question of resource. I just don't have the things at my disposal that I need in order to be able to accept this kind of invitation. I don't have my regular therapy appointment right now. I'm living without the gym that I go to. I don't have the regular worship pattern. You know, maybe if I had the things that I need, then I could feel secure enough to step out of faith and say, all right, God, let's give this dance a go. But I just don't have those at the moment. And the other kind of obstacle, I think, has less to do with external resources and more to do with the way that we internally evaluate and size up the quality of ourselves. We say very much like Moses, I'd love to. I'd love to, God. You know I would love to. I would give anything to do this lifelong improvisational dance with you, but I'm just not that kind of person. It's just not the way that I work. Maybe if I had more faith, maybe if I were the kind of person that likes surprises, maybe if I were the kind of person who didn't have such a hard time giving up control, I could do that. But as it is, Lord, I'm just me. You made me this way, you know, and I just can't do it. And this morning, I'm very heartened, and I hope you all are too, that you're not the only one who thinks that way, and neither am I. And in fact, Moses has very similar blocks in his own relationship with God. And this reading from Exodus is not the only example of this in his life. And so, after coming up with all the problems, I don't have a staff, I don't have the resources. Lord, you know what? I'd love to, but I've never been eloquent. I wasn't then, I'm not now. I didn't have all the things cooking on the stove before the global pandemic, and I certainly don't at the minute. God says, let's 
back up a second. How is it that you and I are even breathing right now? Who did that? Who's doing it? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. Whether you are accustomed to worshiping in a church, whether you're accustomed to worshiping in a church that looks like this, or whether you're accustomed to participating on a regular basis in what we call Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist. Doubtless, it can be in this moment that the greatest of ironies seems to be that the time we most need to eat the time that we most need to be fed with the body and blood of Christ, it is unavailable to us. And I suppose theoretically it could be available to us here now, but so far as we have discerned as a community, we're all one. So when any of us are unable to share that holy feast, we're all going to abstain. And on the joyous day when we gather again to celebrate the Eucharist, we will do so all together. And we will share that incredible moment. But in the meantime, one might say, you know what? I could handle this if we at least had some way of accessing the bread of life in this time, and I just don't know what to do without that. And when I don't have that in my life, it disturbs some sense within me of who I am. And without that, I just cannot say yes to this improvisational life with God that I'm being invited to recognize in this moment and throughout my life. And that is a real quandary to find ourselves in. And the best I can tell is that we have not, in fact, we are, in fact, not even now deprived of that holy food. We're just experiencing it in a different form. Because in fact, you are the Eucharist. You are the bread and wine. You are the body and blood of Christ that is blessed and broken and given to the world. You embody the living sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving just as you are right now, wherever you are. And you have everything that you need in order to fulfill the mission that God has given you. Because whether you were paying attention in confirmation class, or whether you've ever read the whole Bible, God has been at work in your life every trip you have made around the sun. And God has been preparing you for this season of our life together and your life, whatever it looks like, toddler or no. But your life is that offering, even now, in the confines of your home, with the resources that you do have, and God showing up in all the fullness of those so that the world can experience Christ through you. 
If you came here, or were anywhere on Ash Wednesday, if you were baptized, and even in the knitting of your inmost parts, you have been marked as Christ's own forever. And that mark becomes no less faint whether you're in this building or in no building at all. It is the power of God working in you. You may not feel ready. You may not feel prepared, and God knows I don't. But God has given you everything you need to accept this invitation of seeing not just this period as a time to be endured and gotten through and improvising because we have no other choice, but to see all that your life has been and ever will be as a constant holy endeavor of improvising with a God who loves you and no less than with Moses is with you to speak through your mouth, to guide your hands and your heart in whatever way the moment calls for. And with that comes the words from Paul in Romans this morning, I'm not a laundry list of things you've got to do on top of all the other things you've got to find a way to do. But rather I commend them to you as themes on which you're going to improvise with God. And this reading from Romans 12 is full of them, but let me commend three to you because sometimes it's just too overwhelming to sift. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Each of those is a theme on which you're empowered to improvise. Prayer is going to look different for all of us. Patience in suffering looks different depending on where we are. Who's suffering? Am I to be patient because I'm sitting with you in suffering? Am I to be patient with my own suffering? Am I to be compassionate towards myself? Because the hurt that I experience matters too. In amidst all the hurt of the world. And maybe one day rejoicing in hope involves singing at the top of your lungs and maybe one day rejoicing in hope involves smiling, involves just trying to make your face into that shape to somehow remind ourselves that God is with us and loves us and is moving through us and is using us to feed the world and to keep it alive and to carry it through death to a life that's eternal. It's an invitation that has always been ours, but I'm not sure that it has ever been as apparent in my life how utterly dependent I am on God, how much I need the one who made me and loves me as that partner that I can trust, that I know is going to be there, that I know won't leave me looking like a fool because I'm a fool for Christ and Christ loves me and loves you. Your life, exactly as it is in this moment, is saturated in God. As Paul says, you're a temple. Your body in and of itself is a living sacrifice. And it's not the same as being here. But perhaps it's an invitation for us to recognize a far more profound mystery that God is in us 
and always has been and always will be wherever we are or aren't. I commend to you, I commend to us this risky, foolish, life-giving invitation at this time to improvise with God that partner that is steadfast and full of loving kindness all days and to recognize within ourselves the body and blood of Christ with hands and feet and hearts that are to feed the world this day and every day. Be of good courage. You have everything you need. And whatever you continue to need, God is going to show up with it. And with any luck, we'll have something to do with that. Standing in body or in spirit, let us affirm our faith in the vows made at our baptism in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of our body, and the life of us. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We pray we praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have, have mercy, mercy upon us. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put For we our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we, and we shall, shall never hope in vain. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts 
may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that the people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord in peace and unity. We pray for all of God's creation and that it may flourish in preservation. That all may find joy and beauty. We pray for all people in their daily life and work. For all, for all friends, families, and neighbors. We pray especially for those who suffer from any illness in body or mind, from addiction or injury. In this parish, we pray especially for Kevin LeCount, Chris Yetter, Monty Holder, Sally Holder, Jill Bryan, Ann Sanders, Hal Miller, Wilma Miller, Ed Barnes, Bruce Barnes, Carolyn Beard, Stephanie Bias, Richard Kersman, Kay Kersman, Aileen Wood, Suzanne Newton, Roy Wright, Jim Henley, Gina, Ella Wood, Catherine Neighbors, Betsy Cheshire, Ryan Smith, Marie Williams, Jen Nappy, Nick Smith, John Murphy, Mike Elliott, Margaret Hatcher, Pierce Bullen, Allison Ziegelmeyer, Mike Webb, Margie Sved, George Habel Jr., Marianne Boyd, Becky Lopez, Ryan Lopez, Chuck Day, Bill, Lynn, Debbie, Becky, Patty, Nolan, Daryl, Carson, Laura and Ada Fouché, and those affected by the novel coronavirus. Any other prayers may be added silently or aloud. We pray for the well-being of all God's children. We pray that the departed may be granted eternal rest, remembering especially today Virginia Yates. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. Let thy perpetual shine on them. We pray for all who feel a stranger because of the color of their skin, the language they speak, the people they love, their gender, or for any other reason that they may find acceptance among us. That those who hold positions of power may use them for the benefit of all and to lift up those who cannot lift up themselves. That they, that they may do so in the benevolent spirit. We pray for those who suffer from injustice and oppression. For those, for those who help the hurt, hurt and search, search for solutions, solutions to wrong. In our prayers for the church, we pray especially for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Samuel and Anne, our bishops, Imogen, Joyce, and Nancy, our clergy, and Mia, our diocesan intern. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we reflect upon the Anglican communion season of repentance and prayer. And in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for All Saints Church, the Church of the Holy Spirit, 
and the Church of the Redeemer in Greensboro. We pray for all who preach the gospel and all who seek the truth. For the unity of the church. That all may find strength in fulfillment in the God they worship. That all, that all may walk in the way of God's love. Almighty and gracious God, you have made and rule all things by your will in which we ask that you accept the prayers of your people in your infinite and eternal compassion and strengthen our faith and unwavering trust in you. All this we ask in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, you have given, given us grace at this time with one accord to make, make our common supplication to you, and you have promised through your will of the Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. And now, my sisters and brothers, our closing hymn is He's got the whole world in his hand. Let us sing this with exuberance. Let's bring our little people right into our midst and encourage them to sing with us. He's got the 